Good morning. Uh, I love the energy here uh, from the way that Christine starts it, Holly, and everyone else. Uh, this is one of the coolest venues I've ever had the opportunity to share our story at. So I'm going to tell you this morning how we are connecting the audacious world of asteroid mining and space resources with managing and monitoring our own resources right here on Earth. Uh, and you did hear it right, asteroid mining. Uh, it, it is uh, the stuff of science fiction, I think quite certainly. And what we're working on is turning that science fiction into science fact. So our goal at Planetary Resources is to use technology, use remote sensing technologies, robotics. Uh, we can land a rover on Mars, we can put a man on the moon. Um, we can take commercial technology out to really create uh, that spaceship Earth uh, that we uh, heard about earlier this morning uh, and create it everywhere that humans may go. Uh, we are modifying and mastering our environment uh, with every step we take. And the one thing that I think is often most misunderstood about asteroid mining uh, as a new topic is that we would go out into space for the sole purpose of bringing all this stuff all the way back to Earth. And in fact, the first step that we we'll take is almost exactly the opposite. We're going to go into space and use the resources in space to be able to survive and thrive there and use those local resources just as the way we have uh, for eons here on Earth uh, and be able to, to master them. So while we're developing this technology, kind of taking what's from the NASA laboratories, from Silicon Valley technology, uh, programming, crowdsourcing, all different types of techniques, uh, we're actually using Earth orbit uh, a few hundred kilometers up, going a few thousand kilometers um, per hour, uh, and using that as our laboratory. And uh, last year, uh, we were uh, starting towards uh, developing uh, first sensor technology, which I'll tell you a little bit more about this morning. And we were looking for ways to test it, and Earth orbit was the place that we're testing it. And what we found is using that sensor that was designed to characterize water, uh, the most precious of all resources in space, and certainly a very precious one here on Earth. Uh, we found that if, instead of pointing that up, out towards an asteroid, we pointed it down, uh, we could learn a tremendous amount about our own planet that I was actually shocked uh, wasn't already available uh, to, the, to uh, the rest of the world. So as a result of kind of pushing out with this technology for asteroid mining, uh, we're creating a new capability for things right here on Earth. So I'll take just a moment and talk to you about uh, what's on asteroids. And to have something more interesting than Rotterdam smog, let me pass out a few pieces here. Uh, the, uh, the left side of the room will get uh, the, uh, the iron meteorite uh, that's about uh, 30 million years older than the Earth. Uh, the right side of the room here will get uh, carbonaceous chondrite. This is uh, the stuff of uh, future asteroid mines. Uh, that one actually is a, a few tens of millions of years older than the sun. Um, and that represents really the volatile resources of space, hydrogen, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, the stuff of life, uh, th things that we can sequence all sorts of things. Uh, with the iron meteorites, we can use technology like 3D printing to create structures in space and future starship enterprises. Uh, we won't make them in Iowa. Uh, as it turns out, we'll, uh, we'll make them orbiting the Earth and elsewhere. And maybe one day, in the perfection of the industry, we could bring back some stuff that actually is relatively rare on Earth. And those are the, the very valuable but extremely useful platinum group metals, uh, the best catalysts on the planet, uh, the best high temperature refractory metals, uh, things which we reserve for the rarest of use, um, but things that we could make abundant uh, one day in the future. So behind this activity is a team that I'm very proud uh, to be a member of, uh, people that I brought with me from NASA who helped build uh, the rovers uh, that are now driving on Mars, uh, people who worked at Google, people who helped develop the rockets at SpaceX, and uh, also uh, with uh, my co-founders, Dr. Peter Diamandis, founder of the XPRIZE, uh, creator of a variety of different moonshots and uh, using incentive prizes and incentive compositions to, to uh, competitions to change the world. Uh, Peter and I have had a, a great amount of fun in, in uh, developing planetary resources. And if you're looking for a ticket into space, uh, my other co-founder, Eric Anderson, can sell you one to go to the International Space Station. So uh, this is a, a, a team that really is looking to take this technology. The, uh, on the left, you see a picture of me with a full-size, completely functional, uh, uh, self-contained space telescope. That's how big it is. 
so it's actually larger than life up on the screen right now. And we're working on launching this next year. And uh, in just two months, we're going to put on a SpaceX rocket from Vandenberg Air Force Base, uh, the guy up on the top there with a little Stormtrooper Lego. This will be the world's first commercial infrared thermographic imager. And what we were surprised to find, uh, like I'd said, something that was developed to measure the water cycle and to detect uh, temperature differences on asteroids. Uh, when we pointed that down, we realized how much we could tell about planet Earth. And what we're working on developing this into is a capability where we can, on a daily basis, in fact, twice a day, be able to monitor every acre of cropland on the entire planet. Uh, we can take a thermal measurement uh, twice a day, uh, both during the day and during the night, and we can take a hyperspectral measurement uh, several times a week to create what is really a continuous picture of, of a, what's going on with the life cycle in agriculture. So what we're finding uh, in doing this, uh, for one example, uh, we've been doing aerial flights with our thermographic imager using sugarcane uh, as uh, uh, an area of first study. And what we've been able to find is by looking at the temperature of these plants on a regular basis, we can start to see plant stress uh, that's induced well before you can see it with what is the state of the art of being able to measure a vegetative index. And we can lead this stress indication by maybe a number of weeks so that instead of looking at something that you might do next season uh, for the, the problem you've just experienced, we have something that you can direct to uh, be able to solve this problem uh, in the growing season. So uh, the type of thing of, you know, you, cannot, you can't measure, excuse me, you can't manage what you're not measuring. Uh, we're looking to measure as much as we can and really use this technology that was destined for space uh, as something that we can use uh, to measure and monitor all the different uh, variables uh, for what we're growing worldwide whether it's a small grower or whether it's a mega corporation who is doing this. Uh, there's really no difference in our ability to make those measurements wherever we are in the world. We can literally go around the planet every hour and a half, uh, taking a snapshot and providing this data uh, to wherever it can be used. Uh, after this in the roadmap, and this is something that we're uh, just beginning to move from the laboratory uh, into the field, is uh, the capability of hyperspectral imaging. And uh, as someone who's helped put imagers on the surface of Mars, hyperspectral imaging is to imaging kind of like MRI is to X-ray. The amount of detail and insight that you can get by looking at a spectral signature, this is something that allow us, can allow us to phenotype. Uh, what's growing on the surface of the earth. Imagine being able to take a crop plant type census of the planet on a regular basis and understand how much corn is planted, understand those different strains, uh, understand uh, from a, an insurance standpoint when there was damage, not just what was damaged, but how much. And maybe even uh, in the perfection of this after uh, the appropriate amount of research and development and ground truthing, be able to actually get into insights of yields, being able to finally measure uh, what affects yield and what uh, can help uh, increase it, and also do this in a sustainable manner so that we're managing inputs and outputs really in uh, the most sustainable long-term way. So hyperspectral imagery and the, uh, the spectral library that goes along with that is something that we're very excited about. Another thing uh, that we really had to work on is when we're 100 million kilometers away at a near-Earth asteroid on the other side of 10 minutes at the speed of light to get out there and 10 minutes at the speed of light to come back, uh, the ability to take that measurement and do something with it. We're, we're not exactly directly connected to the cloud uh, or a team of researchers. So we're using onboard technology to be able to take these measurements using uh, the beginnings of machine learning processes uh, to automate the most basic parts of this, and then over time, as new algorithms are deployed, we can automate more and more of this. So what you get from space is actually the data that you can act on. So this is a timeline that we're working on. We've been uh, using these sensors in uh, collaboration with a number of different growers. I'm here this weekend really to meet a number of other people uh, who are in this very exciting industry to understand how we can connect the research and development that we're doing uh, to the experts that are in this audience uh, and uh, the new careers and new companies that are being formed really to uh, kind of continue to grow the digitization of farming. Uh, so as we deploy this into space, and again, just a, just a few more months uh, with our first pair of ARCID-6 satellites, uh, next year with the ARCID-100 satellites, and then about two to two and a half years from now, uh, the Ceres constellation, which Ceres is a very special name to me for, as, a, as a space person. Of course, it's the Roman goddess of uh, agriculture, but it's also the first asteroid ever uh, named and discovered. So uh, a nice little uh, non-obvious connection of worlds. 
Uh, and uh, a few years from now, when we have 10 satellites orbiting the planet every day, uh, we'll have this collaboration and a collective of satellites uh, that are really collecting data uh, and proving out technologies that today can help us with global agriculture and tomorrow can help us uh, extend those sustainable resources into space uh, for where uh, uh, precision agriculture will take on a new meeting uh, when we need to do it uh, in new forms of space spaceship Earth that we're creating in the future. Uh, so these are just a few pictures uh, of our babies that are going up to give you a, a an idea of the size of these things. These are about the size of a cereal box. Uh, and this is a kind of a testament to the miniaturization of technology, uh, what we're able to kind of stow away in uh, these rockets that are headed to, towards space, uh, and things that we can build today for, you know, maybe the cost of what an aerial survey was uh, uh, in these times. We can put something into space and have a global footprint for doing it. Uh, so very excited to share this progress with you. Uh, we're growing our team, adding all sorts of expertise, uh, including you know, the data pipeline, the analytics, uh, and of course, spacecraft engineers, uh, business types, and all sorts of others. Um, very excited to connect to what these might be two different worlds, uh, quite literally, uh, and happy to be with you all day and happy to answer any questions throughout the weekend. Thanks a lot. <laughs>